looking out on the morning rain. Ah, ooh, you make me feel so uninspired. Okay, listen. So the other day, I was chatting with a friend who is not a car guy, which, of which I have very few of these people. Well, so you were conducting like ethnographic research or it's like doing science because you're like, how does a normal human work? Yes. And in my course of research, I shared a picture of all of my cars. And his reaction, he's an architect, and his reaction was very interesting. Because as it turns out, people who are not car guys don't lose their minds over, say, E30 wagons. They have very different interpretations. And someone who's in the field of aesthetics, like an architect, is always going to call out different things. So I immediately thought he was going to take one look at the Mercedes and be like, that is amazing. Because you thought that? Yeah. Because architects love what Bruno Sacco's design language was. It was simple. It was straightforward. And there's a very big difference between design and styling, right? And design is function and everything included. That was exactly what Sacco did. But he didn't. He didn't gravitate right to the Mercedes. He went straight to the Ferrari and the Scirocco. Because they're both door stops. Right. They're door stops with wheels. Right. So in this discussion, then I, I sort of like... Is that map naturally to like what your reactions of the public is when you drive the cars also? You know, I thought the Ferrari was going to get absolutely no attention at all. Oh, it gets a ton of attention. I, ridiculous. So you like, own this car before yes. I did. Um, and it, it, like everybody stops and wants to talk about it and is interested. If, although everybody thinks it's um, an Esprit. Yep, a Lotus Esprit. Uh, or a DeLorean because... Or a Lambo. A lot of people say... I've oh, gotten, because it's a lot of straight lines. Right. No one ever knows it's a Ferrari. And of course, yeah. it doesn't have a Ferrari badge yeah, it's on, a Dino it. on it. Yeah, Dino on it. But it does have a Ferrari license plate frame that you yeah. got um, for it. And I think that's perfect because that answers most people's it's questions. It's not just a Ferrari license plate frame. I'm not one of those people. It's Ferrari of San Francisco, which is when there used to be a Ferrari dealer in San Francisco. And it's still called that now, but it's not in San Francisco anymore. Anyway, the frame is from, like, is period correct for the car. It's a period just correct license plate frame. Just want to clarify that I'm not a Ferrari wanker. <sighs> Do you see what I have to deal with? No one is judging you, Derek Tam hyphen Scott. By the way, welcome to the Carmudgeon Show. My name is Jason Discount Sandler Camisa. This is Eric Tam hyphen Naked on the Runway Scott. Um, I think I got your name right. Um, you're never going to live that down. You are just no. going to be forever known as the guy who ripped his shirt open in a Ford Mustang Shelby GT500 video, which you haven't, if you haven't seen whichever camera you're looking at, go watch it right now because it's epic also. The scene of him ripping his shirt off is something that you'll never be able to unsee. Anyway, um, back to this whole design thing. So, for example, the Ferrari, the, those two doorstops get attention. But what I realized is that inadvertently, so the cars that I own, I own because of how they drive. Period. Um, that doesn't quite translate to someone who doesn't like cars. They don't understand like, what that means. But I realized that inadvertently, I have a lot of cars designed by, done, de, design? I'm speaking in some weird, like, pig Latin. I, I have a lot of cars that were designed by some of the biggest names in design ever. And it wasn't on purpose. So, 1975 Ferrari 308 GT4 Dino, that was done by mm -hmm. Marcello, Marcello Gandini. Gandini? Who, who designed, like, a wide variety of weird cars that you wouldn't think are related, but um, they all look like you know when they ever see those experiments when they gave uh, a spider LSD. Have you ever seen that? So <laughs> seriously, they did this. So scientists gave oh, and then had them make webs. Yeah. Yes, I have okay. seen this. And every one of Gandini's designs to me looks like he was just took an extra tab of LSD that day. They're all just a little spastic and crazy and silly and... Um, uh, yeah, I would say like the, coon the shape of the rear wheel opening on the Countach, for example. <laughs> he sneezed. Yeah, okay. Or had a seizure. Or had good drugs. Right? What is the, there's the, I would say the weird thing about the 308 is the wheelbase is too long for the rest of the car. Oh, the car is weird. The, the weirdest thing about it actually is something that you pointed oh, yes. out. Yeah. is that what you loved about the car the most was the curves, and, and everyone's reaction is, what curves? There are no curves on the car. It's the, the, the subtlest, most beautiful curves. It's yeah. the way the front end tucks under in that yeah. incredible radius, yeah. the rear tucks under, mm -hmm. and that unbelievable intake, yeah. um, which, are, which are all round elements on a car that's a wedge. And every, every line that looks straight on the car is actually slightly convex. Correct. 
Um, and to me, the most fascinating thing about Gandini is that, we'll come back to him, but he was not actually concerned with aesthetics. Like aesthetics were secondary. If you read interviews with him, he was an engineer first and he wanted to make packaging yeah. a thing. But, you know, he wanted, not he wanted, he wanted to make sure that packaging was done properly. And that's how that 308 can be a mid-engine two plus two car in a small footprint. Admittedly, it's not like functionally that great at any of those things because you sit in it and you're like, why is the wheel all up in my face? In like knee, the, the yeah. wheel arch from the left front wheel as, as the driver and then the rear seat occupants are like, why did they attempt to put humans back here? Right. And like, why is the engine like inside of the wheelbase and back seats. Like it's, the whole thing is a packaging compromise. It's a compromise, but it actually worked and no one else has been able to do it. Yeah, because everybody realized it was dumb. Okay, like what, was what, 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 what was mid-engine good. four seat cars are there? So there's the 308, there's the, the 308's twin from Lamborghini, which is the Uraco. Right. Uh, there's the successor to that car, which is the Mondial, uh, there's the to, Lotus, to the Ferrari, Lotus the Lotus Evora. Is that it? I, that's that's all. I've thought about this before. Those are the only ones I can think of that uh, are mid-engine. There's got to be something cars. here. <laughs> no, I don't. Yeah, no. I think you're right. But but he did concentrate on the packaging. packaging which well, is and that's why the Miura was so weird because he also did the Miura. Miura was one of his earliest designs that really mm -hmm. put him on the, the map. Are we mm -hmm. supposed to come back to Gandini? Should we move on or should we Gandini I'm now? Sure. Um, the well, packaging of the Miuro is really odd because it's a transverse 12-cylinder V12. Like, there's no other car like that except for another Gandini design, which is the Suzetta, which is a transverse V16, <laughs> um, which is yeah. just asinine. But no, no one, I, I, it was the first production V12 mid-engine car, so the answer to how do you make a V12 mid-engine streetcar, there was no, like, state of the art or like pre-existing thinking no. about how to do that. And so he's like, let's, uh, let's look at the Mini, which mm -hmm. is transverse and has the transaxle, uh, you know, mounted adjacent to the motor and driving the front wheels. We'll just turn that whole thing backwards mm -hmm. and put that in the Miura. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was a clever idea that no one ever did again because there were some functional compromises. To be honest with you, that's not true. I mean, so Mini was the first with that transverse car. To date, every, basically, other than the Audi layout and the Renault layout, Renault layout, every front-wheel drive Saab car 900. is exactly that. And Saab. Every front-wheel drive car has adopted that. And the only ones remaining in production today are Audis that don't have a transverse. Sorry, car. I meant for V12 okay. mid-engine. Oh, okay. And I was going to for mid-engine, the easiest thing to do is in take that whole subframe and move it back, and that's, for example, Lotus Elise and Avora are that way. But yeah. what I think the the industry has realized is a longitudinal uh, mounting is actually stronger because you have a lot more room for a transaxle because the transmission can stick out behind the back wheels and sit between and, the rear wheels, right, and you have a lot more strength. But anyway, oh, yes. you're right. No one has done another transverse V12 uh, V12, but they have certainly car. done V8s and V6s yes. and four cylinders. Yes, Alpha Four so Every in fact, all of the non-supercar mid-engine cars are. Yeah, and we had this experience. I mean, the, the Mira is, is one of those cars that is so beautifully designed that, that when you see one in person, you don't realize how small it is until the first time you see it in person. We'll put a picture of, of uh, Mira versus the uh, my Mercedes 190, which while you're looking at this photo, realize that 190 is smaller than any sedan sold today. Um, the smallest stuff like Ford Fiesta. Fiesta. Yeah, the Fiesta I think was the smallest and it's smaller than that. So it would be smaller than if the Honda Fit were available as a sedan, it would be smaller than that. And look at how much bigger it is than that Mira. And the Miata. Yes. And the also. Miata towers over it. That yeah. was nuts. So the Miata, the Miura is incredible because of it, it has that one of those cars that you just, it, the scale is masked by how good the design mm -hmm. is. And that is the result of packaging because subsequently they, when they replaced the Miura with the Countach, which was another Gandini design, they, the engine is actually longitudinal and the transmission is in front of the engine between the seats and then there's a propeller shaft that goes back to the differential which is between so it was a very that's also never been done again mm -hmm. so when Lamborghini was experimenting with mid-engine V12s I think they were like let's try that oh that didn't work let's try oh that <laughs> oh, also didn't work <laughs> so there was some experimentation but yeah I, I, mean, I think he was driven by packaging when you watch interviews with him and, and he, he makes this comment and the same thing with the Marzal which is another weird Lamborghini thing which was a one-off glass d gullwing door thing that had a half of a V12, which was an inline six, the only Lamborghini inline six. And 
in order to get the packaging to fit, he had them reverse the direction of the rotation of the engine. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you look at one of those in profile, it's very odd because the trans because of the position of the transaxle, it's almost rear engined because the transaxle is transverse in front of the engine. Mm -hmm. um, but Although I think you can say that most of Gandini's designs were bizarre. I mean, if we think about like, Let's consult the list. Right, this, the list is ridiculous. First of all, the Chisetta Marauder, which you, you mentioned a second ago, yes. it wasn't that crazy until you started really looking at it and you yeah. realized it had three fucking headlights that were in a pop-up. <laughs> I mean, it was insane. <laughs> um, also, you know, the fact that it was a, it was a V16 with, with all of the problems that that... It was actually two Yurako V8s right. uh, end to end right. uh, mounted together. Insane. But that's what I should have been singing. A Giorgio Moroder song. Oh yes. Because Mar Chisetta Moroder was Giorgio Moroder, who was a it was a French, with a name like that. How could he possibly be French? Giorgio? Is he? I think he is. He was, but either way, it was a disco. It was like German. it was a DJ. He was a musician. Yes. Um, who, so like, I should have significantly been. contributed to the creation of electronic music. Yep. Anyway, sorry. Uh, we also have. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say Gandini did the E12, the, f the first five series, right? They're not E12. Well, it's e described as the, yes, yeah, E12, which is right. so odd because it's such a conventional shape. Yes and no. When you look at that car, you see things about it that are just a little bit LSD spidery, right? And if you start looking at some of the details, it's a little bit, it's a little bit crazy. And I think that was his most restrained like one. What? Oh, just the window window openings and the sort of the front cant of the front end. Every time Which I look at that car, which then became standard BMW fare. Right. But I guess this was, was the origin of that. Well, the 2002 and right. the E9. But this was all toned down. The E9 was so splendidly beautiful. The, there's something really quirky about that E12. Um, anyway, but that's that's the normal one, and it yeah, goes that's crazy quite far his most there. normal right. design. I mean, there was also I think another. Thing that I think is just spectacular that he did was the Jaguar Piranha, mm -hmm. which is a one-off concept that uh, Jaguar was like, um, <laughs> lay off the drugs, buddy. And then he was <laughs> like, okay, Lamborghini, how about you? Would you like this design? And Lamborghini's like, yes, I'll have that. Uh, and so the Piranha design was basically sold to Lamborghini and became the Espada. Uh, and it's like a huge flat hood, and then it's a, it's a four-seat car, but it doesn't look goofy the way a lot of four-seat cars of that like era did. Uh, it's really, a, and it has the vertical. It doesn't look weird. Do Sorry. It doesn't um, look goofy. It, what I mean is that it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love it. No, 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 no. What I mean is that it, it doesn't look proportionally challenged because like it has back way. seats. Yep, like when they made a 2 plus 2 E-type, that's proportionally yep. challenged. And I think the Piranha was a response to how badly the 2 plus 2 E-type turned mm -hmm. out, frankly. Interesting. Um, like what other like the the dots and anything that started out that wasn't supposed to be four seats that they made four like seats like the Porsche Panamera like the, the Porsche Panamera <laughs> there there was a concept 911 that was a four, two plus two that was heinous there was a 928 that was a two plus two which uh, yes wasn't which was kind of a shooting break yeah. kind of thing yeah. which was also terrible uh, the the 240 or 260 Z two plus two also an abomination aesthetically yeah. so anytime so so I what I meant to say is that the design is coherent and doesn't look. Right like a bastardization of something, of something else. else. Right. Uh, and I really admire the Espada for that because it's like, let's embrace the fact, and it's an interesting solution to, to how do you put back seats in a car that's kind of rakish and you end up with like an almost flat rear windscreen and the vertical glass panel mm -hmm. Prius style, which was also appeared in the Maserati Camson, which uh, was also designed by Gandini. Mm -hmm. Uh, with float, complete with floating lights in the glass panel, like just hanging out, surrounded by like, you should look it up. I think I realize that. Uh, yeah. It's really wild. It's for the Euro cars. Mm -hmm. The U.S. cars, of course, got some terrible, terrible, terrible crap, egregious yeah. solution to that. But in any case, I, I like that he was like, let's like f embrace the four-seaterness of this car mm -hmm. and solve the like awkward hunchback problem by making the rear window almost flat and mm -hmm. then making like a rear window lip that's vertical, which is very that's really neat. very neat. They, but what I like the most about it is this whole, the whole Piranha thing, the, the Espada thing. So I love the Lamborghini Espada. I think it's really great looking. Uh, I like big, enormous hatchback um, four-seaters like, for example, the Rover SD1. Yes. Which I have such a soft spot for and just saw one again recently. And In motion. Um, it was being towed. Right. Um, yes, but that it, sounds it, it right. It does start, but it was, a, it was a friend that was moving from one warehouse to another. And I just, it's, it's, it's breathtakingly beautiful. Um, in Euro trim, um, and its proportions are breathtaking. But more importantly, what I loved about that was the fact that 
Marcello Gandini designed that car for Jaguar. Jag said, no thanks. For the SD? No, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, for the I'm Piranha. Back to the Piranha. Sorry. Uh, did that Jaguar Piranha for Jaguar, and they said, no thanks. And he wholesale sold it to Lamborghini, and they're like, fuck yeah, let's go. That reminds me of one of the other cars that, that, that in my collection. So oh, yes. we'll come back to Gandini in a second. But the, inadvertently, the other one was, was um, Giorgetto Giugiaro, which no one knows how to pronounce, but it's Giugiaro. Giugiaro. Um, Just like it's spelled. J-E-W-J-A-R-O-H. Giugiaro. Uh, if you know the Italian pronunciation rules, then it is it's pronounced just like it. The Italians don't know the Italian pronunciation rules. They fight over the CCs being a CH and the C, whatever. Anyway, so G Giorgetto Giugiaro. Giugiaro did the Mark I Volkswagen Golf range. So he did the, the Golf or Rabbit, as it's called in the US, the Jetta, the Scirocco. Um, he did all of those cars. Uh, my Mark I, my Cabriolet is a Giugiaro design. The Mark I Scirocco was a Giugiaro design. The Mark II, they, he showed them their, his styling proposal. They said no thanks and stole it. Steel is a very strong word, but what he did for the Mark II styling proposal was this sort of more rounded thing. I think the show car was the Asso de Fiori, which is the Ace of Flowers or something. Um, I don't know. Um, but the VW took his Mark I design and, and melded it with the Mark II design. So he took the Mark II design, that Asso car, the, the Ace, um, car and flattened it out and made the Mark II Scirocco. It's very that's clearly, why it's a little more straight liney yep. than that concept. And it's very clearly still, uh, still, rounded. still his design. I mean, it's still 100% his design. Yeah. Um, but then he said, I love you guys very much. Thank you for all the business and sold the design to Isuzu, which then made the Piazza. Isuzu the Piazza, it was called in the rest of the world, Impulse in the US. And you put a Scirocco and, I have a picture of mine. Mark II. A Mark II Scirocco and a Piazza next to each other. Especially the back. And you see. Yeah, it's the same car. Yeah. It's up to some where the creases are, it is the same car. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and of course, the crazy thing is, the Isuzu Piazza is based on the, it's, it's an Isuzu chassis that was the chassis used for the Chevy Chevette. <laughs> um, so it's not a good driving car, even though Lotus wound up trying to fix the suspension as best yes, as they could. Yes, tuned by Lotus. Tuned by they Lotus. Have that little fender decal. But if you look at the overhang, the front overhang on the, the Impulse, you're like, wow, that's got to be a front-wheel drive car because it was designed to be a Volkswagen, and uh. it's not. So it's this front-wheel drive car with this, uh, this rear -wheel front drive. engine rear drive car with all this overhang that doesn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny, but I love the idea of an orphan of a car that was sold to two car companies at once, or you know, one that said no, and so it went to somebody else. I mean, another Gandini design that's kind of like this uh, is the, the GT4, 308 GT4 and the Urocco. Yeah. Both have a lot of similarities. Same car. Uh, like, and, and a lot of detailing also, like the shape of the creasing on top of the trunk lids mm -hmm. is almost exactly the same between those two cars. But I mean, I guess you could say there's only so many ways to cut a two plus two mid-engine transverse. Here's, here's a very controversial thing that I say all the time. Look at Mura, look at 308 GT4. It's the same car. It's stretched to the completely wrong proportions, right? Roll your eyes harder, hit your bullshit button, let me have it. That was very violent, Derek, damn hyphen Scott. I disagree I, strongly with you. Okay, well, I'm sorry you feel that way, but when I look at the rounded elements that you love so much, they're the fucking same between the two cars. Um, the overall shape so is... So the car looks the same from the waist down. The roof line is different, yeah. Of course, they're the different cars, cars look the same from the, the same waist down. Cl very clear to my from eyes. The, the it, center line of the axles down. I, which is a large portion of the car. Yes, that's where most of the weight is, really. Okay, and most of the design is too, so fuck off. Uh, yes, so yes, the daylight opening line is different. No, but it's, my point is only that they are very similar cars when you start looking... It, Similar enough that it's clear they came from the same pen. And a lot of Gandini's designs were that, that way. I mean, the Countach looked like absolutely nothing else. I think there's more similarity between the Countach the, and the 308 GT4 than the Miura and the 308 GT4. You don't think of the 308 GT4 as sort of halfway in between the two? Yeah, okay. Is that is maybe chronologically? No, that's not true because the Countach came Predated. out before yeah. the 308 GT4. Yeah. But it's just, he, it was his signature. These sort of crazy shapes you never saw in nature where... Especially the point where if you're looking at the car from behind or from the front, the widest part of the car is like quite a bit off, higher off the ground than most cars. Like most cars, like the mass is down low and that car, the, the widest point is like about even with the tops of the wheels. 
Like think about how the, the rockers tuck in yeah. on a Countach sure, that's true. and a 308 GT4. That's a very distinctive part. It's, it's of one of his design. signatures, right? And it, but it's the sa same. The, the, the thing is, Jajor, uh, uh, God, these fucking G's. Gandini's designs were very clearly Gandini's designs. I don't. I can't think of a car that he did, did where you're like, really, he did that. Let's consult the list. Hold on, I, do that for sure. But what I was going to say is, Jajaro, on the other hand. He had designs that you don't realize uh, are yes. the same. It was the opposite. Yeah, Jujaro and was fucking all over the all map. All over the map. All of it's great, but it, none of it looks related. In, well, Not none and of then it, you but start to cars. look at it. So look at Scirocco versus Audi 5000 wagon versus if, like uh, Audi or Quattro, for example. He yeah. did a lot of these cars, right? That's all from the same concept car. It's all from yeah. the same thing. But then park a Mark I Golf Rabbit next to a Lancia Delta. It's the same car. He did the same thing with that tapered seat pill. The whole thing, it's the same fucking car. And I'm not gonna argue about which one I think is prettier or which one aged better because I think that's the Volkswagen. But really, it is the same car. And, and he got away with it when Gandini didn't. His stuff had a signature on it. Like, you knew it was Gandini when Jajaro was like sneak attack. So talk to me about lists, things. Um. I think it's most interesting to go to Jujaro. So people often ask, do you guys do research before? Finally, this is the first episode that we've done. You like, printed out three I, whole pieces of paper. <laughs> <laughs> well, normally it's off the top of my head, yeah. but it, there's so much. I mean, here's like, the thing. Let's look at, so Gandini's cars were, were basically one page followed by a couple. Yeah. Jujaro's cars Jujaro are stuff. three, four pages. And let's just go through like random cars that are like, Strangely, really, so the Alpha GTV, the original GTV from the 60s, like he did that. He did the the successor, which was the Alfetta, and the he did also the Alpha 159, <laughs> uh, which I think is one of the most beautiful sedans ever made. Yes, wagon, even better. Yes, also true. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he also did the first generation Lexus GS. Um, I mean, right there, you could stop right there. That GS was had nothing to do with any of those other cars. Yes. Nothing. I mean, you could tell he went through phases, right? He went through the early phase where it was like very pretty 60s stuff, like uh, Alpha GTV, and he did the Gordon Keeble GK1. Uh, he did, what else? He did the, the Bertone Jet Ferrari 250 uh, SWB. Uh, so that's very like mm -hmm. 60s looking stuff. Right. And then he like started getting a little crazier in the 70s. Uh, he did the BMW M1, for example, and that's very like 70s wedge-shaped yep. cars. And currently with that, he was doing, though, like you said, the Mark I Golf and the mm -hmm. Delta, uh, Lancia Delta. Uh, and so those are like the very like angular right. 70s box-shaped cars. They were cars. wedgy. They were all very wedgy. And chunky. Yeah. Right. And then he went kind of blobby. Uh, oh, we should also mention during the wedge phase, he did Maser a lot of work for Maserati. Right. So he did the, the Ghibli, uh, the first Ghibli, the real Ghibli, not the Chrysler 300. Ghibli, that you consider whatever. that wedgie? Uh, it's, it's, so that car had a lot of straight lines in places where cars normally didn't have straight lines uh -huh. in 1966, 67, mm -hmm. when that car came True. out. It was really very, like, the f one of the earliest production cars that it was characterized by a lot of sharp lines and creases mm -hmm. on it. Uh, and then he did the Bora and the Merak, which is basically the same design but right. with a six-cylinder engine. Uh, and so that's very, like, 70s. Let's see what else is here. But what I love is, like, I'm just looking at this list at the corner of my eye, and you have BMW M1, mm -hmm. um, Lotus Esprit. Those are, there's a similarity there. Yes. Um, EB, oh, he didn't do the 110, he did the no, 112. No, he did. He did all okay. the blobby ovoid ones. So like, then you can tell by the 90s yeah. he's into, like, he's full-on in blob that mode. So that's phase. where the Lexus GS... Yep. 300 comes from and the blobby Bugatti concept cars. Buick the, Park Avenue Ultra's interior seating. Which is also very blobby and the Maserati 3200 and, four, and 4200 which are... Those are the crazy taillights, right? Yeah, the right? boomerang taillights. Uh, and then, uh, let's see. What did what he do else? for Porsche? There's a Porsche listed on here. Mm, that I can't. He didn't do any production Porsches. Okay. Um, yeah, but his stuff, that is Oh, true. and the Saab 9000 is, like, actually, I think not very blobby for him. I guess it's pre-blob era because it's now... He's moving the, into the blob. The 80s, yes. He's, he's, it's the, mm -hmm. the Saab 9000 actually acts as the transition between the Lexus GS and the, like, Lancia Earlier Delta stuff. Volkswagen yeah. Uh, yeah. Mark I. And then he did the, the DeLorean, which is also a... DeLorean's a Scirocco. Yeah, it's a Scirocco-shaped car. Yeah. And that's funny because you look at that car and you're like, oh, it's mid-engine. It doesn't have a mid-engine vibe to it. I guess because it's... The, sorry, the, the DeLorean. DeLorean's not mid-engine. What is it? Holy fuck, I stumped him. <laughs> the DeLorean is not mid-engined. Where is the engine in that car, Derek Tam Scott? Behind the seats? Mm-hmm. 
Is it rear-engined? Yeah, it's 911. No one knows this. It's the most amazing part of, the, of automotive. That car, let me, let me just talk a little bit about, about the DeLorean. We should probably just do a whole episode on it. That was supposed to be a mid-engine car using a rotary engine. GM, I think it was, he was contracted with GM, canceled their rotary engine project. He, he was like, oh fuck. Contracted, he meaning being John, John D. DeLorean. DeLorean. This is after the car was already supposed to be in production. He's that late. Contacts Citroën and says, hey, can I have one of your four cylinders? They're like, I don't care. If you're like, he, I don't know. Why Whatever. would he want a Citroën engine? Those engines are like tractor engines. Fuck knows. He was going to turbo it. They found out that he was going to put a turbo on it because this thing wound up being you know, far heavier than it was supposed to be. And it was a big car. And they were like, go fuck yourself. The, uh, threw the cigarette at him. He had no engine. So this is after the car's supposed to be in production. Not only does he not have an engine, he also doesn't have a chassis. So he contacted Porsche and Lotus. I think that's when you go home. Right. He contacted a whole bunch of people and were like, this is my budget. I got $3. Who can make me a chassis? Porsche said, fuck you. We're not interested in working with you. And Lotus was like, right. Well, we've got this Y chassis thing from the Esprit. So it's a Y up front and a Y in the back, right? That's, so it's basically the passenger. Backbone. Backbone, right? Where are you going to fit a mid-engine? Can't. Because but the, the Esprit is mid-engined. Yeah, but their, the suspension is in the Y, right? It wasn't going to work on the DeLorean. So they put the engine in the Y in the back behind the rear wheels, and it worked. And by I the mean, way, it was that's a, a charitable definition of worked. It worked. I mean, the car goes Look, down the, the road. The crazy thing is he grafted that uh, rear engine design. This is, I guess, another Jujaro masterpiece, right? He grafted a rear engine design onto a car that was supposed to be mid-engine, and no one noticed. There's a whole fucking engine back there. And not just an engine, a PRV V6, a 2.8 liter V6. Terrible engine. Yes. But it's all behind the, it's behind the rear axle. Anyway, I mean, I think that, that could be an episode on cars that mask their ridiculous where their engines are, all the Bentleys with the W12s hanging out in front of the headlights. The you need to know. Yeah. Anyway, hmm. but that's, that's one of Jajara's masters is that he could, he could pull off packaging things as well. Yes, but he was like, it wasn't driven, his decisions weren't driven like Gandini's were uh, by packaging. Right. Like, Gandini would start with the package and then he would design the car around it. And well, I think that kind of shows. I mean, Gandini's stuff is not really mass market. He did Citroën BXs and weird, weird stuff. Whereas Jajaro, I mean, again, to this list, it's like everybody and their mother yeah. did a Jajaro car and they never stood out as being anything but pretty. They just worked. Yeah, and you couldn't tell that they were designed by the same person right. because he was, I think, good at getting a design that was representative of the brand he was working for right. instead of just like, I'm going to create this thing, now who will buy it? Jaguar? No? Okay, how about you, Lamborghini? Right. Well, <laughs> just worked on the list. Well, and look, and he did the same thing with the Rio GT4 and the, and the Lambo, the Oraco, right? Same thing, he sold the same design. Here's a question for you. Flip around that argument. Bruno Sacco. I think of Bruno Sacco as one of the possibly five greatest designs designers ever. Um, but he did one design. He did once. Yeah, and he like refreshed it a few times, and then the last time he did it, he was like, okay, it's perfect. And right. then he, he went home. And it home. was done. <laughs> and we're, of course, talking about <laughs> the, the R129 Mercedes. Right, well, SL. in chronological order. Yes. He started, his first design for Mercedes was the W126, mm -hmm. which I think he went halfway on. On his philosophy, yes, because right. you could, like, it has a conventional three box form. The trunk and the hood are about the mm -hmm. same height. The trunk is pretty long and sort of trunky, right. the way that a conventional sedan was, if you right. compare it to the 116 before it. Right. And it was an evolution of the 116 with a little yes, bit of a touch. With a lot it. of cleaning up right. and, like. And then was given the job to be design, head of design and came out with the design language that was the W201, the 190E, mm -hmm. the W124, the E class you know, 300 E, 500 E, um, and then ultimately the 140, uh, which is not his most successful design, and the no. 129, yes, which, which was is his most best. successful design. Right. He thinks so. Um, I think the R129 is perfect, but I also have Robert Cumberford from you know, the, the design curmudgeon from Automobile, who yes. I have endless respect for, saying he agrees with me that the W201 is the best proportioned small sedan ever made. Period. Yeah, or but that's might have been quite some qualification 
small sedan. I, it, so it is but hard to get good proportions on a small sedan. It's, it's harder to do good proportions on a small sedan. Right. So we're talking about packaging stuff, and this is a car that's smaller than a Fiesta and doesn't look like the blob that the Fiesta does and that new terrible BMW 2 Series Grand Coupe. And all these other small sedans don't work, and they tower over that 190. I mean, it's way better. Um, so, but Sako made this styling language that worked on a subcompact sedan, a full-size S-Class, a Roadster, the 124, which is probably actually the best, the best of all of them. I, I mean, yeah, I, I equivocate between the 124 and the 129, between the SL and mm -hmm. the, the, the E-Class. The mid-size car. As, but so here's my question. Does that make Sako any less of a genius? Because he just had one hit. Like, it, you know, here's the thing. If, how do I know if a car was designed by Bruno Sacco? If it is a Mercedes and it is perfect, it is Bruno Sacco, right? What other Mercedes before or since? I think been, a lot of the Paul Brock stuff is very beautiful also. That's 116 and Pagoda and, and 108. 108. Beautiful, but not life changing, right? I think it's the same way as the guy who, Klaus Luther is the, the German guy who did this, this E30. Um, Pretty design. I really love the car. I, I love the way it looks, but it didn't move the no, I agree. needle, right? It was just a conventional design. It was actually, it was another design that he sort of continued to, to refine. And I think- So what else right. did he do at BMW? I don't think he, I think he did this. He did like, he did the E32, the seven series, which was a major, a major change, but I don't think it, and he- I like the E32 a lot. I, I think, think it's it, very handsome. Right, but I think the big change was actually afterwards. E36 to then E38. Eight. I think that, E38 is the best looking 7 Series ever made. I think that it's incredible. The it's high incredible. deck, short high deck, it looks so athletic even though it's a big car. I just saw a shorty sporty, so a short wheelbase, yeah. four pack, 740. I had one. I don't know if you got, yeah. knew that. I knew that. Um, it's just it's sedan perfection. Yeah. Um, so even though this guy was good, I mean, he's unfortunately his notoriety is that he went to jail for murdering his son, um, like Marvin Gaye's dad. Did yeah. Marvin Gaye's dad have consequences for that? I, I just know. know that he killed his son. I know. I think this was a pretty tragic situation. I think the son was addicted to drugs, and it was one of these like this poor guy probably had to kill his son in self defense. Whatever. That's that's what he's known for. But I just I look at that car and I say, okay, I like the way it looks. It's a nice design. Uh, sorry, it's nice styling, but it's not the greatest design in the world. Sacco's designs, he is the one that came with that, came up with that rounded, the rounded hips at the like sort of octagonal shape of the back yes. of the car. Yeah, um, which you he, see in the 190 and the 124 oh, yeah. when you look at it from the back. There's just this wonderful radius to look the right at the, of the trunk. Look at the 2.316 versus the E30 M3 and look at what BMW had to do to the E30 to get a wedge shape for aero. That was Sacco. Yeah, saying, the entirely new trunk lid and the entirely new rear roof section, which is a separate panel. Roof section, just so they could change the angle of the, the glass or whatever, screen. right? I mean, he was the the two hundred ones coefficient of drag in nineteen eighty two was zero point thirty two, eighty four technically for the two three sixteen. I mean, you put a, a two three sixteen next to a CLA. an Audi five thousand. Well, but hold on, my but point it was is also point three. Is only you look at the those cars, time. those boxes, including that car. And we have not gotten that much better in terms of coefficient of drag Correct. in 40 years. Yes, um, but the cars look a lot more melting, right? melty. And that was, that was Sacco's genius, is to say, I'm going to make a formal, squared off looking car, but I'm going to round it where the air wants it to be rounded, not where my eye wants it to be. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, so you have, you also have a Sacco car. I have a Sacco car. You have a 500E. Uh, Which is annoying because when that gets sat next to the 2.316, it's just that much more evil and aggressive looking. Yeah, I mean, the fender flares help a lot. Yeah. That, the grill, you have a post facelift, so it's a much later car. It's 10 yes. years newer than my car. Correct. But I like it f very well with, with the pre-facelift grill also. You, I prefer, think the whole you really prefer it as a facelift. Yeah, the, one, the whole early 124s without the sacco preta, you know, the, the big side. The cladding, things, the cladding, I think, is necessary, but I don't think that the think, facelift yeah. grill with the curved edges. Especially the U.S. lights. Easy. I think the early 124s. Well, yeah, the U.S. lights are unfortunate, right. but that's easy enough to, to fix. Uh, yeah, so I have a sacco car, I, and I had a 500 SL before, and you mm -hmm. had a 300 SL. Yep. So we both uh, had 129. Do you ever have any uh, Jajaro cars? Yeah, Delta Integrale. The Delta Integrale, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that's a fun one to park next to a golf. That was only at Radwood. At a, I was at a Radwood, and I saw a Delta Integrale backed up to a Mark One Rabbit, 
And I was like, mm, 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 mm. oh my God, <laughs> mind blown. They are the same car. Yeah, it's amazing how you can go th like look at cars for thousands of hours over the course of your life and then be like, I never, never realized, thought that yeah. those were, realized those were the same car. Uh, and Gandini also, Gandini Designs, so I had the 308 yeah. and I like own the remains or part of a Mira or something. <laughs> I don't know how to <laughs> characterize that. But um, perhaps the most beautiful car ever made. People say that. I don't. I can't be objective I about never that car. He, okay, here's the thing about the Mira. I never agreed that it was the most beautiful car in the world until I saw one on the road. Hmm. When you see it on the road and it's a quarter of the size you think it is, where there's other, other of others of the most beautiful cars, part of their beauty is their imposingness. Yes. A 540K special roadster. Like that is the car in which you run over the peasants. That is an amazing car. But without the imposing factor, because it's the size of a shoe, um, that was when I realized the power of that design. It is spectacular. Yeah. Um, and I'm sorry to have compared your most beautiful car in the world thing with the 308 GT4, which was universally panned as the ugliest Ferrari ever made. Um, I really like that car. It's, it's a car that made me really happy to every time I interacted with it. I much prefer that to the the Pininfarina 308. Oh, yeah. Uh, especially when you take into consideration driving. There's probably an episode in there about like, There's a, 308s. 308s are not a 308. There's a different yeah, and how different right. those, those but, two cars But are. I bought the 308 GT4 because of how it drove and wound up staring at it every time it's in the garage. I just kind of look, and there's so many facets to that car that are just so abnormal, but you don't notice mm -hmm. because the overall shape is so... Attention commanding. Attention grabbing, yeah. Um, are there cars from a designer that you would buy just because of the way it looks? Um, I don't know if it's from a designer, but there's a lot of, I mean, I am an intrinsically like foolish car buyer in the sense that I make a lot of irrational decisions when I buy cars because I just like the idea or human? because yeah. I like the, the look of it, but it's like, why would I buy an Alfa Romeo from the 90s, a front-wheel drive Alfa Romeo from the 90s? Like, because, because it looks and sounds spectacular and is terrible at everything else that it does, <laughs> basically. But uh, So, like, the Alfa 164S, yeah. uh, for sure. I, I mean, the, which also I owned in the form of a, a Peugeot 405 MI16. That's true. Um, aesthetically. Mm -hmm. uh, like the That's another one. Peugeot 405 versus Infiniti G20. Yeah. Did yes. He, did, did, I don't think he's I don't, I don't think he did in any of those. these. Because that was was that a Pininfarina design, the 405. I believe it was. Uh, yeah. And certainly the 164 was, which yeah. uh, is the relationship hmm. between those cars is very yeah. clear. Uh, the, the, like this, any 12 cylinder. Like I had a 12 cylinder Jaguar. That is an those aesthetic. Are, I would I would own an XJ6. You had a Daimler Double 12, but I would double own six. an X, Double Six. Sorry. Double 12. Single 12. Would, right? Single 12. <laughs> um, I, would, I want a Series 3 XJ6 just because of the way it looks, but I want a small block in it because I just don't want to deal with the Jaguar bullshit. Uh, I would very much own my Daimler again. I would, or I would own any Series 3. I think the Series 3 is one of the most beautiful cars ever made. I agree. Uh, would you want a... Uh, terrible packaging. That's one of those cars oh, yeah. where you're like, why is the car so big and so small? You get in, you open the trunk and you get in the car and you're like, it's tiny in well, here, and then but the, the car is massive. And the engine doesn't even fucking fit under the hood. I yeah, mean, you like, open it up and you're like... Everything is small. You'd think, okay, it'd be fine if like, the car is 25 feet long and 20 feet of it is an engine compartment and then you can understand that there's no passenger compartment or trunk. But there was yeah. no room anywhere in that. Yeah, thing. it's a spectacular failure of packaging, but it's absolutely beautiful. That's why it's so beautiful. Well, I would say that I would have a Maserati Quattroporte before. Which one? The Ferrari one. The Quattroporte 5, 2005. Five, sorry, the, right, 2005 and later. Once oh, because Gandini did the Quattroporte 4, which never came to the U.S. Right, which was beautiful. It has the Countach rear wheel opening. Arches, it's got the yeah. weird yeah. angle yep. on the rear wheel opening, so that's the Gandini tell mm -hmm. on that car. Uh, I would, I mean, I would have a, I would have the odd number Quattroportes. I'd have a one, a three, and a five. I would definitely have a five. I mean, that was a car that I had on my mantle for years. But the strange thing is, I talk about cars that I would own because of how they look, or I want to own because of how they look, like an Alpha SZ. I must have one, and yet I don't. The cars that I own are all because about the, the uh, because of well, the, the way SZ they drive. The SZ supposedly drives like fantastically. No, but I don't have one. That's the thing. I have to go back. I have to look at what I do have and what I spend my money on. And even that friggin' e-golf, 
the, uh, Volkswagen, a public or a Wikipedia anyway, is crediting Mark Lichter. And Mark is the head of Audi design and has done some pretty cool stuff. Uh, but 10 years ago, I was sitting at a dinner with Walter De Silva and he sketched out the Mark 7 and showed it to me. And I was like, oh before my God. Before it came out? Oh, five years before it was out, six years before it was out. Mark this was six, when the, 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 the Marshmallow Golf was yeah. the thing, the, the five. So he did, so five was done internally. Or I don't know who did five. De Silva was brought in to I think fix it should say that six. way. Whoever is responsible for that should have no, they should have, uh, they should be infamous should be only. Infamous. Yeah, exactly. Six, the crazy thing about Mark Six Golf is that Six used the same glass and I think it was the same door skins. It was the same car and it went from the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Volkswagen to a really, really pretty well refined, yeah. well and refined yeah, design. Then that, when that happened, I was like, thank God. Yeah, thank God. That, and I didn't realize it was all the same shit. And then the Mark Seven. And that was Walter like, De Silva. And I remember, so I was at that launch with him and he was showing me how, just sketching. I wish I had these sketches, but somebody else took them on a napkin. They were like, I passed them around the table and some asshole put it, pocketed it. But um, he was sketching like, it was, his thing is horizontal lines. All yeah. of De Silva stuff is just it's nothing but great, horizontal. Which is very sacco actually. There's a ton, a ton of horizontal of lines right. on his designs. Uh, but, but nothing superfluous. That's what I think mm, the the lower cladding on the pre facelift 126. I think the the amount of lines on that is superfluous. Fair enough, fair enough. But mostly in the design of the car, he, I feel like the best the best designs, my favorite designs, and you're gonna shoot me when I say this, come from Italians who are constrained by Germans. Um, Bruno Sacco's Italian, Walter De Silva's Italian. I mean. You know, Giorgetto Giugiaro, when he was working for the Italians, that's why I think the Volkswagen Golf aged better when than the... When he was working the, for the Germans. I'm sorry. I think that's why I think the Golf aged better than the Delta because it was just a little bit more restrained and a little bit more subtle. Um, and that speaks to me. And it's Mark, Mark 7, you compare that to that abortion of a Mark 8 that's coming out that looks cartoonish. Seven it's still not simple. a bad-looking car, as the vast populace of cars go. But yes, no, but I think the Mark the Seven is really yeah. Right, they took that simplicity and purpose Elegance. of of line. Every line has a reason to be there yes. on Mark One, Mark Four, Mark Seven, and not on Eight, for example. I think that's a really important distinction between styling and design. Also, is like, is there superfluous stuff? Like, you look at modern Hyundai stuff, and you're like, wow, that's quite stunning. It's remarkable. And then you think, well, how's this going to look in a few decades? I, th I don't think it's going to age well and uh, there's a lot of, and Mercedes does this a lot too uh, BMW does actually I guess everybody Everyone kind does, of now. does it now. and when they don't do it i.e. Walter De Silva's Passat people say it's boring but 10 years from now that is that Passat, the current which Passat that's current is that Passat, yeah uh, pre facelift is what he did but it was very simple and very architectural in the same way that Audis are and people still the same thing well they say the same thing about Audis well they're boring yeah, but they're stunning, stunningly designed and stunningly executed. Designs. And I think that they're going to age really well. Also. They always do. How, name one Audi that didn't age well. Look at your wagon. Starting from then, starting from the Aero era Audis of the early 1980s, they have all aged incredibly well because they're restrained. The C5 A6, the back I never really sat that well with me. Compared to other cars of But yes, yeah, you're right, you're right. right. Compa I'm, I'm picking nits right. for sure. I don't think the first generation A4 was like, it had a little bit of like aero blobbiness to it. It's a little blobby, but I, I think it's still, that I didn't in like. the same way that Audi TT is a little bit roundy and happy and floral. I mean, it's a squashed beetle right. is what yeah. it is. But it's, it's a beetle. That, and it's still a little bit too puffy, but it aged really well. I yeah, think I agree. Nobody, it looks pretty timeless. Nothing aged better. No, no car in the history of the world has aged better than Sacco's cars. I mean, they're 30 years later, they still looked fresh. And everyone's Crisp. still stealing their design. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hopefully we look that good in 30 years. Are we done with this episode? Okay, so if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you go to the ECME YouTube page, click subscribe, and most importantly, click on that little notification bell so you know whenever we publish something, which could be something like a Car Majin Show. It could be something like a proper care and feeding episode where I yell at you for doing something terrible to a car. Or it could be an Icons video. Or, for all we know, it could be Derek Tam hyphen Scott ripping his shirt off and firing the most be beautiful that. flag girl ever. Come on. Do we do it again? Nope. That was a one-time deal. Oh, well. I tried. <laughs>